Good afternoon. On behalf of Professor Barry Rabe, the Ford School of Public Policy, and in particular, the International Policy Center, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our fourth webinar event for the North American Colloquium on Climate Policy. The North American Colloquium is an ongoing collaboration between the Ford School, the University of Toronto's Monk School, and the Centro de Investigaciones sobre América del Norte at the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. I would also like to acknowledge the generous support of the Meany Family Foundation for making this year's programming possible. Today's event focuses on the politics of oil and gas pipelines with evidence from Canada and the United States. First, Andre Lacours will present findings from his research with Daniel Beland, comparing the politics of pipeline expansion in case studies from Canada and the US. Then Amy Janswood will present from her research with, <clears throat> excuse me, with Sarah Martin and Kate Neville, which focuses on two proposed pipeline expansion projects in Canada. As audience members, you may ask a question in writing using the Q&A feature on your Zoom control panel. During the Q&A, uh, we'll get to as many questions as possible, but apologies in advance, we will not be able to get to all of them. We may go about 10 minutes past the scheduled end time of 5 p.m. local time in order to accommodate as many of your questions as possible. It's now my pleasure to introduce Andre Lacours. Andre Lacours is professor in the School of Political Studies at the University of Ottawa. He is the author or editor of numerous publications on the topics of nationalism and federalism. His recent books include Nationalism and Social Policy, The Politics of Territorial Solidarity, published by Oxford University Press, and Fiscal Federalism, an Equalization Policy in Canada, published by the University of Toronto Press. Andre? All right, thank you very much, uh, Josh. So uh, the paper that I'll present today uh, was written with my colleague, uh, Daniel Bellin from McGill University, and it starts with a puzzle. And the puzzle is this one. Um, pipeline development in Canada has triggered a fairly serious intergovernmental conflict. Uh, such development is wanted by the government of Alberta, uh, the main oil and gas producing province in the Federation, uh, but has been you know, opposed or, or lukewarmly endorsed, depending on where you stand, by the federal government. Uh, and strongly opposed by uh, several other provinces. So um, there has been fairly severe intergovernmental conflict in Canada around the issue of pipeline development. In the United States, although there's been um, similar pipeline development to take uh, Texas oil out of the Permian Basin, uh, there's been very little intergovernmental conflict, both in relation to um, the relationship between Texas and the federal government and with neighboring states. So that's kind of the puzzle that we start with, uh, looking at why um, intergovernmental conflict has been so much more prevalent and severe in Canada around pipeline development to carry Alberta oil out of the province than it has been in the United States to carry out, to, to carry Texas oil uh, uh, out of the state. Um, there's some kind of basic uh, explanations that we would be drawn to that don't um, that don't work very well. For example, um, we could think that you know oil is more important for one uh, for Alberta than it is for Texas or in Canada than it is in the U.S. Uh, but you know, really, that's not the case when you look at uh, some basic statistics. Uh, oil and gas extraction uh, as percentage of GDP, for example, in the two federations, quite comparable. It's eight percent in the U.S., seven percent in Canada. If you look at the importance of the oil and gas sector uh, in Texas and Alberta, it's also about the same in terms of you know, percentage of GDP: nine percent for Texas, eight, ten percent for Alberta. So there's no easy explanation that come out of this. One important, I guess, uh, difference when it comes to just raw numbers, and that's striking and, and, and fairly important, I'll come back to it, is that Alberta represents a much greater proportion of the overall uh, oil and gas industry in Canada compared to what Texas represents in the US. And I think that's, that's important. So, so, so we develop our explanation around four factors that we think all taken together, uh, you know, help us understand uh, this puzzle, crack this puzzle, if you will. Uh, 
The first factor is the constitutional and regulatory framework. Uh, so basically, you know, what I'll explain here is that uh, in Canada, the federal government is much more exposed uh, to, uh, uh, you know, decision making around pipeline development. It has to arbitrate between different positions in the way that the United States federal government does not. The second factor we'll look at is the ideological and political connection to oil that exists both at the federal level and at the, the constituent unit level in both federations. Thirdly, we'll look at um, indigenous opposition to uh, pipeline development. Um, strong indigenous opposition can uh, provide some momentum for opposition on the part of either the federal government of, or constituent unit governments. And what we'll find here is that uh, it's, it's stronger and more, more, uh, more central in, in national politics in Canada than the US. And finally, our last factor is uh, the fact that in Canada, there is a, uh, an equalization program that uh, seriously aggravates the oil producing province of Alberta uh, uh, which then kind of, um, you know, uh, enmeshes the discourse about pipeline uh, development with a, a broader criticism of fiscal federalism in the country. So those are basically the four factors that I want to discuss uh, fairly uh, briefly with you here. So let's start with the issue of kind of regulatory framework. Uh, for starters, I mean, the idea behind uh, developing pipeline uh, as the government of Alberta wishes, is to take Alberta oil to new markets. Alberta oil right now, Alberta is landlocked and it can only export to the United States, very dependent on the US market. Uh, and it doesn't want to be, right? Uh, but in order to go, uh, to go east and west, so to export oil to either Europe or Asia or both, uh, you need pipeline to cross many different provinces. Um, and, and um, so pipeline development in Canada becomes automatically an issue of Canadian federalism. Right? Um, and the regulatory framework in Canada basically as confirmed by a Supreme Court of Canada uh, decision uh, uh, in 2020 is that the government of Canada, the federal government uh, has sole authority over the regulation of both oil and gas pipelines, right? So the, the government of Canada needs to basically approve pipeline development for it to occur. Uh, other provinces, neighboring provinces or provinces whose territory would be, uh, you know, affected by uh, new developments in pipeline uh, really have uh, uh, constitutionally nothing to say and, and, and materially nothing to gain uh, either because in Canada, uh, uh, the natural, resor natural resources are property of, 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 of provinces. Uh, so the long and short of it here is that in Canada, the federal government is, as a result of the constitutional and regulatory framework, placed in a position where it has to arbitrate uh, a conflict uh, between oil producing provinces, uh, mainly Alberta, but also Saskatchewan to a lesser degree, uh, uh, and, and essentially non-oil producing provinces who have very little to nothing to gain uh, from pipeline development, at least in very concrete terms. Now, uh, of course, the Texas experience uh, with oil is a little bit different because it already has uh, uh, a more considerable uh, pipeline network geared towards export. It also, of course, has access uh, uh, to sea. Um, uh, so perhaps we could make the argument that more pipeline development could be seen uh, uh, by Texas as less crucial to its economic, uh, uh, overall economic development than it is for Alberta. But at the same time, uh, we know that there's been a tremendous pipeline expansion uh, as a result of the Texas production boom. Um, uh, and, and, and this has not created the same type of intergovernmental conflict as we, uh, we've seen in Canada. Uh, and, and, and again, to, to start with, we need to look at, the, I think, at the constitutional re regulatory framework, which is quite different than what we find in Canada. Uh, the, the US federal government does not have an authority comparable to its Canadian counterpart on the construction of, uh, of, of crude oil pipelines. In fact, it's, it's, it's very much a state by state basis, um, which, you know, sometimes doesn't 
uh, involve very stringent kind of uh, uh, authorization or, or, or requirements. Um, so what I'm saying here is that the US federal government has very little exposure uh, in relation to the building of oil pipelines, unless of course it crosses international borders or federal lands, which reduces the potential for federal state conflict. And on uh, gas pipeline, uh, the regulatory framework there focuses on, you know, uh, a self-described independent commission, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. So which also, you know, provides some insulation to the US federal government uh, in terms of these types of decisions. So that's, that, that's factor one, basic uh, kind of constitutional and regulatory framework differences between the two federations. Point two, more focused on ideology and politics here. And, and I think in Canada, what's important is that the current liberal government uh, led by Prime Minister Trudeau um, really came to power by stressing two things, uh, fighting climate change and operating a reconciliation with uh, First Nations. Um, and, and of course, we know that, you know, the Liberals' uh, uh, climate change commitment uh, puts the federal government in an awkward position when it comes to, um, uh, uh, to potentially supporting pipeline development, because then it's accused of being hypocritical, right? And, and, and the federal party system in Canada uh, features other parties on the left of the Liberals, uh, the New Democratic Party, the Bloc Québécois, and the Green Party, all small parties, mind you, but that, that, that really uh, press the federal Liberal government on the issue of climate change, right? So from, from, and if you, from a pure electoral perspective, you know, the Liberals really have never have any success in the province of Alberta. They don't actually have a seat there. Uh, and not much of a prospect for one at the forthcoming elections whenever they come. So there's very little political incentive for uh, uh, the federal liberal party to, um, uh, to say aggressively support uh, a pipeline development. Uh, it's also an awkward position when it comes to the so-called reconciliation with First Nations agenda of the Liberal Party of Canada, because of course, many different uh, uh, First Nations in the country have opposed uh, pipeline development uh, out of Alberta, not all of them, mind you, uh, but, but uh, probably, probably half of them. Uh, there's also political and ideological opposition coming from two important provinces. One is British Columbia, uh, where a pipeline would need to cross in order to take Alberta oil to, uh, uh, to sea and then eventually to an Asian market. Um, uh, the BC, uh, BC has been governed by uh, the New Democratic Party and, and, and at some point in the coalition with the Green Party. So very, uh, I guess, uh, unfriendly political forces for pipeline development. And the same can be true in Quebec, where there's, there's of course, there's a, there's a more conservative party there, but, uh, uh, you know, national identity in Quebec is very much enmeshed with the notion of being green. Uh, the province really works with hydroelectricity. And uh, the Quebec Premier has uh, clearly stated uh, to his Alberta counterpart that he didn't want uh, Alberta's quote unquote dirty energy anywhere near, uh, near his province, uh, comments for which he later apologized. Um, so that's in the United States, of course, I think the scenario, the political and ideological scenario is quite different. Oil has historically been much more central to the United States and its economy than it's, uh, than it's been uh, to Canada. There's also, I think, a political connection linked to the kind of the United States global uh, superpower status, uh, you know, slogans like energy independence, really, which were present in the United States under George W. Bush, uh, and even from before have, have really been absent in Canada. Um, uh, so we don't have this dimension. Uh, and also to put it simply, the, the party in Canada that's friendlier to the oil and gas sector and pipeline development, the Conservative Party of Canada, which a bit on that, on that note would be the equivalent of the Republican Party in the United States, uh, just doesn't govern Canada as often as the Republican Party governs the United States. Um, uh, so of course we know that the previous uh, administration was very uh, sympathetic and supportive of, of pipeline development. Uh, 
Um, and what's also interesting is that uh, neighboring states to Texas uh, have generally been very supportive as well of pipeline development, uh, in part because some of that oil is used by them. Um, and also because a lot of these states are, are, are oil and gas producing states. And I think there's, there's, there's a connection that's formed there, which, which we don't really find in Canada, except for the Alberta Saskatchewan tandem, right? And for example, in the US, there's an interstate oil and gas compact commission, a lobbying you know, a commission where oil and gas producing states get together. And again, that, that kind of common front really doesn't exist in Canada. Third factor uh, is, uh, uh, is indigenous politics. Uh, and, and the idea here is that, you know, if indigenous uh, uh, opposition to pipeline development is strong, um, then it gives uh, some momentum, some ammunition, some would say, uh, to governments who want to formally uh, and, 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 and really politically and perhaps legally and constitutionally oppose it. And uh, we found in writing this article that, uh, you know, it's, it's a much more notable feature in pipeline politics in Canada is, is the voice of Indigenous peoples. I think for two reasons. The first is that in Canada, there are stronger legal anchors uh, for such opposition on the part of Indigenous peoples. Um, uh, in BC, for example, the issue of land has not been settled, uh, and the Supreme Court of Canada has recognized that governments have a duty to consult uh, with, in, with Indigenous peoples, with First Nations, uh, whether the land was ceded uh, through treaty or not. Um, so that's a big difference with the United States, whereas you know, domestic dependent nations, uh, tribes really... Uh, 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 indigenous politics is really about maximizing sovereignty over, uh, over reservation. So in, in this context, if a pipeline uh, is not uh, going to go through an actual reservation, uh, the, the, the legal and constitutional um, opportunity uh, to fight it is much, much weaker than in, in the United States than it is in Canada. So that, that's one thing about indigenous politics and pipeline development. And the second thing is, is just the fact that, fairly simple fact that uh, uh, indigenous politics overall is much, much more central uh, in uh, Canadian politics, especially federal politics, than it is in the United States, right? I mean, in Canada, uh, you know, it was an important uh, aspect of uh, electoral campaigns, uh, both in the last one and back in 2015. Um, all the leaders of, of the main parties were made to speak about indigenous issues and so on and so forth. And of course, in the United States, it's not the case. I, I don't think there was one word uttered about that uh, in the last uh, in, in the last presidential election. So that that's that's a big difference. And in addition, in Canada, there is uh, this 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 uh, certainly on the part of the Liberal Party of Canada and, and some other federal parties or perhaps all of them except the Conservative Party, there is this wide acknowledgement that you know, the, the relationship uh, between Indigenous peoples and the Canadian state is, is still of a colonial nature. Uh, there's been a lot of commissions and documents uh, produced, um, which, which, which means that, um, you know, I think provinces opposing pipeline developments there have kind of, of course, natural natural allies in, 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 in many First Nations. So, uh, whereas in the US, again, very striking uh, for a Canadian anyway that, um, and of course, I'm not a specialist of Indigenous peoples at all, but it's still striking to me just an, as an interested observer, uh, how absent, I guess, Indigenous uh, issues are from, uh, from at least federal politics, which is really what I can see uh, uh, from, uh, from Canada. Finally, um, you know, Canada has, uh, you know, a program, a transfer program as part of this uh, fiscal uh, federalism that's called equalization. And it's a program essentially that seeks to uh, bring provinces that fall under a national uh, fiscal capacity average up to that average uh, so that they can provide uh, quality public services of uh, public services of comparable quality uh, to wealthier provinces at a comparable level of taxation. The United States doesn't have uh, such a program. It's actually, you know, the only uh, 
liberal democratic uh, advanced industrialized federation not to have one. Uh, but in Canada, what this means is that Alberta is never a recipient, is a recipient of equalization. Uh, uh, so for that reason, it, the Alberta government really doesn't like the program. And, and, and that has given, that has fed the discourse of the Alberta government on pipeline development, because the Alberta government has basically said, look, the rest of Canada is not allowing us uh, to develop our economy as it should be developed, uh, but it's, it's very happy to quote unquote, take Alberta money in the form of territorial distribution transfers through equalization. Uh, and the Alberta government has really denounced this uh, uh, position as hypocritical, has uh, announced it would hold a referendum in the province for the purpose of, uh, you know, speaking uh, about the equalization program. So the combination of uh, uh, the Alberta government's effort at uh, creating greater pipeline development and its uh, status as a non-recipient of the equalization program and its resentment towards uh, the whole program in general as, as um, I think, as uh, amplified intergovernmental conflict around equalization because, around, sorry, around pipeline development, because it's also become intergovernmental conflict around equalization. Sometimes the Alberta government talks about equalization, but they're, at the, they're really talking about what they see as the failure of other governments in the Federation to support pipeline development in the country. So that's the paper in the nutshell. And the conclusion, you know, really what we do is we try to, you know, to rank these factors. And what we say is that we think that, you know, fundamentally it starts with, you know, the different constitutional and regulatory framework. And then it proceeds with, you know, the different types of political and ideological connections to oil that we find in the two federations. Uh, with, you know, the indigenous issues, I think just feeding into that and, and, and the presence in Canada of an equalization uh, uh, program being kind of the cherry on top of the Sunday there in terms of creating tension in the, in the Canadian Federation. So thank you very much for listening and uh, I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Andre. That was a very <clears throat> informative and interesting analysis. And at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce Amy Janswood for the next presentation. Amy Janswood is a postdoctoral fellow at the University, in, sorry, in the Department of Political Science at the University of British Columbia and a visiting fellow at the University of Victoria's Center for Global Studies. Amy earned her PhD from the University of Toronto, one of the partners for the NAC, in political science and environmental studies. Her research focuses on Canadian and comparative energy and climate policy and politics. Amy, and she's gonna share her screen. Yeah, I'll just get that started. Thanks for that really warm introduction. I believe you can all see my screen. I'm joining today from the uh, traditional- Not quite yet, actually. Oh, okay, one second. That's okay, these things do tend to happen. Perfect. It was inevitable. Yep, now we're seeing it. Perfect. Okay, great. Okay. There we go. Okay, so uh, I'm joining today from the traditional territory of the Lekwungen peoples in Victoria. And I want to acknowledge that this is unceded land and indigenous title has not been uh, surrendered to the Canadian government. The presentation today is based on a paper that I've had the great pleasure of working on with Sarah Martin at Memorial University and Kate Neville at the University of Toronto. And Kate will also be joining us in the discussion. And this work really builds on my doctoral research on contemporary Canadian oil pipelines and social movements and Kate and Sarah's work on the historical and financial dynamics of infrastructure. Our paper is still very much in development, so we're really looking forward to your feedback in the Q&A. This is an image that might be familiar to you. It's a stockpile of pipeline from the proposed Keystone XL. This was a project that was initially framed as a bullet pipeline by the oil industry to provide a more efficient route to transport heavy oil or bitumen from Alberta to the Gulf Coast. 
most of the pipe was actually purchased back in 2009 and 2010 when the project was initially proposed and TC Energy, or as it was then called TransCanada, was extremely confident about the project. Uh, but this pipe has been sitting outside uh, degrading ever since. Given the climate crisis, growing uh, domestic oil production in the US, changing global oil demand, and a bunch of project delays, it's really quite surprising that the project was able to persist as long as it did. As I'm sure you're uh, familiar with, uh, Biden put the uh, final nail in the project's coffin a few weeks ago, and construction on the US portion never uh, actually got underway. So this was really what uh, this kind of dynamic motivated our research. How was it that Keystone could remain in this sort of liminal or zombie state, neither built but yet, uh, not yet canceled? And so we really began to investigate the commercial and financial underpinnings of this kind of mega linear energy infrastructure. So today I thought I would take you through how we think about mega oil sands infrastructure projects and mega infrastructure projects more generally. And then I'll give some highlights from two of the empirical cases. In the paper, we do a deep dive into the financing and the commercial viability or lack thereof underpinning two mega oil sands pipeline projects in Canada, Northern Gateway and Trans Mountain. Like the Keystone XL, they also got stuck in this sort of liminal state, although uh, not for as long. And using these cases, we show how the complex financial arrangements that underpinned these projects created layers of risk that obstructed pipeline construction, but also paradoxically enabled these projects to persist. And we argue these arrangements allow these projects to persist despite significant and growing risks. And then I'll just wrap up by speaking a bit about what this means for other fossil fuel infrastructure projects and other major energy companies in North America. We position our work in political economy, but we draw on the infrastructure scholarship more broadly uh, from a range of disciplines, including geography and sociology, which really understand built infrastructure as both embedded in and underpinned by social, legal, and financial relationships. And we use the term mega project as economic geographer Bent Flivberg does to understand this subset of built infrastructure projects that typically cost around a billion dollars or more and includes new transmission pipelines. We also use his concept of sublimes to really explore the underlying visions and logistics that drive these projects. And we suggest it's the promise of economic growth and investment that embed pipelines into particular visions of the future. We use assemblage thinking to understand the financial complexes that, under, um, that really support or underpin infrastructure proposals. Assemblage thinking has really been developed in science and technology studies, and it helps us understand complex dynamics and encourages us to pay attention to relationships, processes, and interactions. An assemblage can include actors, ideas, institutions, or even the environment itself. And in our case, the assemblage is along what the oil industry calls the hydrocarbon value chain. And here pipelines play a crucial role because oil is only valuable, of course, if it can be moved from where it's extracted or produced to where it's refined or where there's demand. And it's this transmission process that generates economic value. The assemblage to make a pipeline project is very expansive and it includes everything from the characteristics of the bitumen or the heavy oil that would flow through the pipeline to the pipeline company itself, the oil producers and refiners that wanna ship the oil, the states and regulators that must approve a project, uh, the indigenous nations and landowners whose land is crossed, the banks that finance the project and the list goes on. And we think that using the concept of assemblage really opens up new ways of thinking about pipeline politics and allows us to understand pipeline proposals, not just through the actions of pipeline owners or companies or government decisions or executive orders or even oil prices, but to a much more complex set of dynamics among multiple actors. Uh, understanding this idea of assemblage requires us to really explore the process of turning the idea of a pipeline into an investable asset. This process is called assetization, 
which is as jargony as it sounds, and it's the making of assets to extract financial value, be they physical infrastructure, farmland, various loan products, or the new world of carbon finance, although the process of assetization itself isn't new. We draw on sociologist Jan Specker and his idea of fictional expectations, which he's developed, this idea of narratives that underpin investment decisions. And Becker suggests these expectations are fictional or invented because the value of the asset isn't tied to some inherent quality. Rather, it's what investors think the value will be, and that's what really drives investment. Pipeline stocks have often been thought of as blue chip or widow and orphan stocks. And so they're believed to have relatively low volatility and they pay relatively high dividends. Pipeline companies are generally seen as stable, and although they might not be setting growth records, they are generally financially sound. And so it's these narratives that drive investment in new pipeline projects, despite their risk. So we explore these dynamics in two cases in Canada, Northern Gateway and the Trans Mountain Expansion Project. Both of these projects were incredibly ambitious and were proposed by some of the largest pipeline companies in the world, Enbridge and Kinder Morgan. Uh, Enbridge is based in Calgary and, and Kinder Morgan is based in Texas. These projects were designed to move heavy oil from the oil sands through British Columbia to coastal waters. And both projects would require over a thousand kilometers of new pipeline and would cross dozens of communities and indigenous territories and some urban centers as well. To give a bit of context, these proposals were part of an incredibly ambitious wave of oil uh, science pipelines that the industry was really beginning to think about in the early and mid 2000s. This is a map from the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers in 2008, and it shows over 30 new and proposed oil pipeline projects. At one point, the industry was even planning an expansion from Trans Mountain North to Northern Gateway's terminal, which hadn't been constructed yet. Uh, this was a fairly absurd idea, and it never made it to the regulatory stage. Um, another bit of a wild idea, TransCanada was planning a pipeline to California, although that also didn't make it to the regulatory stage either. It's important to point out that these plans were really directly linked to making the oil industry's growth viable um, and to to increase production in the oil sands. The oil sands were growing fairly modestly at this point, as you can see uh, right here. But oil companies were planning to really accelerate their growth and new pipelines meant that the oil sands could expand even faster. And so this is what these two figures show. These are forecasts that CAP developed, uh, the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. And these forecasts weren't based on factors of production or demand, but purely on what oil companies wanted or hoped for. And they were used by the industry to justify a number of new pipelines, including Northern Gateway and Trans Mountain. This is a quick snapshot of some of the key regulatory and legal dates and decisions for each project. And I include this here just to highlight the liminal state that we're interested in explaining the period of time after the projects were approved, but before construction started. And for Northern Gateway, this was from the summer of 2014, when the project was approved by the, regula the regulatory agency, the National Energy Board, to the end of 2016, when it was ultimately canceled. But for two years after it was approved, Enbridge didn't start construction. And for Trans Mountain, it was approved by the federal government in 2016, but construction didn't start until mid-2018 and construction still hasn't really gotten underway yet. So to briefly take you through the Northern Gateway case, early on, Enbridge had a hard time securing contracts from the oil companies that were wanting to ship oil on the pipeline. And so because of this, the project got put on hold. But in 2008, Enbridge was able to revive the project. The company created a plan, which was quite unusual and involved asking oil companies or the potential shippers to pay for some of the pre-development work for the pipeline. And this really allowed the project to get revived. Enbridge required a significant support from dozens of indigenous communities uh, across the route of the pipeline, but many indigenous communities, uh, including many First Nations in British Columbia along the route were uh, staunchly opposed. 
In 2012, there was a massive protest outside Enbridge's annual general meeting in Toronto, which is pictured here. And it was led by an alliance of Indigenous nations that travel by train across the country to present at the AGM about the risks of the project. It was not until 2013 that Enbridge um, took seriously really the, the participation of Indigenous groups and offered them an equity stake in the project, although many argue it was too little too late. Uh, this did help the project get approved the next year, but less than half of the eligible Indigenous groups were partners and progress really stagnated trying to get more buy-in. So this is one of the only pictures of representatives of the Aboriginal Equity Partnership. Um, this was with uh, the project president in 2016. And this was ironically when they were asking the regulator to, um, to have an extension on the project sunset clause. Enbridge had already pushed the project timeline back a few times and the project was stalled largely due to overwhelming opposition, especially from coastal First Nations and BC and over a dozen legal challenges that were pending. Uh, one of these challenges revoked, or a consolidation actually of several legal challenges revoked the project certificate and eventually the project was cancelled by the federal government in 2016. Although it's important to point out that at the time that it was cancelled, the project didn't have any firm contracts with shippers on the, on the pipeline, it didn't have any financing and construction hadn't started yet. So now turning to Trans Mountain, Kinder Morgan also had shippers help finance the pipeline. And they quite creative, creatively used funds from the existing pipeline to finance the expansion. And this was also very unusual. Unlike Northern Gateway, where there was no pipeline, Kinder Morgan was planning on twinning or doubling an existing pipeline. Kinder Morgan also restructured itself in 2014 in order to better secure debt. This meant that it couldn't finance the project itself. So after the project was approved in 2016, Kinder Morgan started to try to find a joint partner to finance the project, and it couldn't. So it had to go public uh, and launch what's called an IPO, an initial public offering, in order to raise capital. It actually raises capital to pay off um, Kinder Morgan's debt. And in the process of launching the IPO, this was the first time that Kinder Morgan really had to be honest about the risks that the project was facing. These included delays, uh, cost overruns, public opposition, changes in public opinion and reputational damage. And the Sequamic, uh, the people whose uh, territory is in um, a significant part of the interior of BC, called uh, the pipeline Standing Rock of the North and argued that Kinder Morgan was still misleading investors and pointed to many risks that potentially undermined Kinder Morgan's market valuation. But even still, the IPO allowed Kinder Morgan to proceed with the project and start trying to finance it. Although at the same time, the risk landscape was really dramatically changing. There were over a dozen legal challenges and there was a new provincial government in BC that was really adamantly opposed to the project. Incredibly, Kinder Morgan was still able to secure over five and a half billion dollars in loans from major Canadian banks. And it was at this point uh, with the loans that Kinder Morgan was able to start preparing for construction. And at the same time, opposition was continuing. There was significant protests like the one pictured here, continued opposition from British Columbia, um, delays and more cost overruns. And so in March of 2018, Kinder Morgan essentially threatened the federal government that it would walk away from the project unless the federal government stepped in to help. And so the government ended up buying the existing pipeline and plans for the expansion. As you can imagine, this was a very good deal for Kinder Morgan and their investors voted unanimously on the sale. And the day after the sale, the federal government, or sorry, the federal courts revoked um, the project certificate, which was now held by the federal government. And this created another major delay for the project. So I just wanna highlight a couple of dynamics in both cases. First, there were quite novel arrangements that allowed the projects to keep moving forward, um, whether it was having oil producers actually fund the development of the project, uh, using equity deals to mitigate risk or launching an IPO. Second, in both cases, the pipeline company was fairly successful in mitigating or rearranging corporate risk by strategically using contracts with shippers or restructuring their corporate entities. And so the pipeline companies were able to walk away from both projects with relatively little loss. 
And the last thing I'll note here is that uh, the discourse in Canada and the US around the loss of Northern Gateway or Trans Mountain um, or the, the government's purchase of it, and even the loss of Keystone was mostly about fictional economic losses, the loss of potential future benefits or potential future investment or jobs, not real economic loss that because the companies were uh, quite successful in, um, in maintaining uh, fairly balanced portfolios and fairly positive uh, ratings. So if we return to this classic political economy question of who wins and who loses, in the case of Trans Mountain, the public is on the hook for something that doesn't exist yet. It's the idea of a pipeline that was made into an asset through these financial arrangements that actually created real financial loss for the public. And the taxpayers are now on the hook for a project that was initially proposed to cost around $5 billion and is now uh, $12.5 billion and continuing to increase. And pipeline companies and energy companies that have proposed these projects are moving away from new mega oil sands infrastructure or offloading them on governments and are now focusing on other markets, including uh, Mexico and the US and other fossil fuels like shale gas. Conventional wisdom would suggest that these companies would be suffering, but that's not the case. And this is where financial expectations play an interesting role because these companies are still highly valued and investors have a lot of faith in them. And today, even though money is flowing away from pipelines and into renewable power and utility stocks, pipeline companies still have very attractive valuations and investors are still considering them to have, and I quote, resilient and low risk business models that are well positioned to grow into the longer term, in the words of one analyst. Of course, pipeline um, pipelines and pipeline companies are still a site of contention a coalition of over 100 organizations are working to leverage the financial vulnerability of mega pipeline projects. And they're targeting some of the largest banks, asset owners, investors, and insurers that are supporting other fossil fuel expansion projects, including uh, and currently Enbridge's Line 3. This coalition is building on the divestment movement and other pipeline campaigns, and it remains to be seen whether they'll be successful in defunding these projects. And just a few thoughts um, as we conclude and, and open up the discussion. As we've shown, mega infrastructure projects are not only technical and political, but also financial feats. And energy infrastructure, including pipelines, are part of an asset class supported by very powerful financial actors. However, the process of assetization is much more contingent and contested than what many investors assume when just looking at numbers on a page. And third, these projects are surprisingly flexible and involve incredibly creative ways to keep them alive. Although there are limits, as we saw with Trans Mountain that make um, projects eventually unviable for a private company. And lastly, using assemblages helps us go beyond seeing these projects as just beholden to party politics, which is often how these pipelines are portrayed by the industry or in the media. And we also open up what we mean by political in these projects. Political means not just the politicians who are making decisions about permits or whether or not to support a project, but political in the sense that assetization really centers on power relations and itself is a political process. And I'll leave it there for now. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Amy. That was really, really interesting. And um, in a moment, I'm gonna, um, uh, we're gonna have two of uh, Amy and Andre's co-authors joining the panel. And we're going to kick off the Q&A with Professor Barry Ray. But at this point, I wanted to remind our audience that you can submit questions for any of the panelists in writing using the Q&A feature in your Zoom control panel. Um, if you would like to direct your question to a particular panelist, please just note that when you type your question into the Q&A panel. So joining Andre and Amy are uh, Daniel Beland and Kate Neville, who I will, each, who I will briefly introduce now. Daniel Beland is director of the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada and the James McGill Professor of Political Science at McGill University, an expert in comparative fiscal and social policy. He's published over 20 books and more than 150 articles in peer reviewed journals, such as Comparative Political Studies, Governance, Journal of Social Policy, uh, Policy Sciences and Policy Studies Journal. 
Kate Neville is assistant professor at the University of Toronto, again, one of our NAC partners, where she is jointly appointed in the Department of Political Science and the School of the Environment. Her research is positioned at the intersection of contentious politics and global political economy, with a focus on contested energy and extractive projects, much like the ones Amy was just discussing. Her first book, Fueling Resistance, The Contentious Political Economy of Biofuels and Fracking, is forthcoming with Oxford University Press. So welcome, Daniel and Kate, to the conversation. And to kick off our conversation, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Ford School Professor Barry Rabe, who is responsible for all of this year's NAC programming on climate. He's the J. Ira and Nikki Harris Family Professor of Public Policy and the Arthur Thurnau Professor of Environmental Policy here at the Ford School. Barry is going to ask our first question and welcome our panelists. Barry. Thanks so much, Josh, and thank you for all of your hard work in leading and engaging this process. You've just done a wonderful job since joining us earlier in the year. So, Josh, great to have you involved. And my sincere, warm welcome to all of our colleagues for, for joining us and sharing in this important conversation and sharing your very interesting work. So, thank you. Um, listening to the talks, clearly learn a lot about differences between major petro states like Alberta and Texas and some of the big issues moving across Canada. But Amy, I'm mindful of that map you showed that demonstrated so many of these big pipelines, either existing or proposed that go back and forth across the national border dividing Canada and the United States. And, you know, I'm mindful as we think of the last 25 or so years of Canada-US energy relations, we've often had federal governments and presidents and prime ministers moving in very different directions at a given moment, not just Justin Trudeau and Donald Trump. Now, we would think that there is an alignment here, and yet one of the first acts that newly inaugurated President Biden took was to shut off one of the very pipelines that we've been talking about today, just a few weeks before he would hold a remarkable Zoom meeting, bringing together the respective cabinets of the two government and pledging a new Canadian-American climate and energy partnership. So I'm curious to any of our authors how we might think about this Canada-US relationship when the federal governments seemingly are more likely to align? And, and do we begin to think about a coordinated set of pipeline and related transmission policies? Are the differences and the interests that take place within each government just too fragmented and splintered to, to expect something along those lines? Thanks, Barry. So any of the panelists jump in, yes. I can start if you don't mind. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And I thank uh, Andre because I'm, you know, uh, he's a great presenter. I'm not. So it's great that he presented our, our, our paper and he's the lead author anyway. Um, but, uh, you know, I've been thinking about these issues for a while. And, and you're right, uh, Barry, what happened recently. Uh, there was a meeting earlier this week. I know few Americans noticed, but there was a, a meeting, a, a virtual meeting. Uh, between uh, uh, Justin Trudeau and um, and Joe Biden, and yes, one of the first things that Biden did is to cancel the federal permit for Keystone XL. Um, what's interesting to me is how these things uh, play out politically internally. So when uh, when it was announced that Joe Biden will do this, in fact, he had said this long before uh, uh, um, you know he, he entered the White House and, and early during the the, the presidential campaign that he will pull the plug on that federal permit, right? So it was not something unexpected. Um, and uh, when uh, this came out that he, he, he basically issued an executive order to pull the plug on that federal permit, uh, Justin Trudeau was blamed by K Jason Kenney, the premier of Alberta for not basically uh, uh, going uh, after Biden and starting, uh, some people said the trade war at least, talking about sanctions against the US for doing this. Uh, and of course, that's something that the Trudeau government doesn't want to do. We had our problems under Trump with the reopening of NAFTA and so forth. The last thing we, and, and you know, uh, uh, commercial sanctions uh, on aluminum and so forth, trade sanctions. So certainly uh, uh, that was not something that Trudeau wanted to do, but he was criticizing Canada 
for not being bold enough in defending the interests of Alberta, which are closely tied to <coughs> Keystone XL. So yes, Keystone XL is about Canada-US relations in that sense, but in Canada, it's also about the internal politics of grievances between Ottawa and the provinces, especially Alberta. That's what I wanted to say to kickstart the, the discussion about this, this really, uh, I think, very timely question. Thanks. Does anyone want to add anything to that? Andre? Just, oh, keep, sorry. Let's go to Amy first and then Andre. Yeah, I'll just keep my answer brief just to echo Danielle that it really was about the, uh, the role of the provincial politics and the Alberta government who was really holding the purse strings, you know, had already spent a billion and a half dollars. The Trudeau government bought a different pipeline, but it really was the Alberta government and the Alberta taxpayers that were on the hook. And so uh, it was really about trying to develop you know, political cover and try to blame the federal government, although a lot of people had suggested that this project wasn't really going anywhere and construction hadn't gotten underway in the US. Yeah, just a quick, a quick uh, I guess, Barry, my answer would be that it's, it would be very difficult for the, uh, the two federal governments to, quote unquote, work together on these things, because on the, on the part of the Canadian federal government, it's impossible to kind of aggregate the different territorial interests and then to then express them right so 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 what do you do um you're in canada you're always going to have the federal government's voice and then you're going to have although i understand that they have very little standing in speaking to the us directly but you will have voices of provinces right so if you have a federal government who uh you know, wants to slow down pipeline development, then you will hear the Alberta government. If you have a federal government that maybe wants to push ahead with pipeline development, then you will hear some other provinces like BC, like Quebec and so on and so forth. So um, I would say here the, uh, maybe the, uh, the more profoundly federal and <laughs> nature of Canada and the uh, ide ideational and uh, policy discrepancies really kind of probably hinders uh, the kind of really strict bilateral uh, dealings that we could have on, on these issues. Great. Um, so the next question, uh, we're gonna kind of be conscious of the fact that many of our audience members are from the Michigan area um, where a different pipeline actually owned by Enbridge, one of the same companies that um, Amy and Kate's and Sarah's work talked about has already been built underneath uh, the Great Lakes. And um, I think the, folks are wondering, are there any lessons, even though, you know, that your cases were at an earlier stage, um, dealing with the financing and all of that, are there any lessons from your research that can be applied to, you know, what activists can do now about the Enbridge Line 5? Yeah, that's a super question. Um, it's a lot more challenging to the politics change quite significantly once the pipeline is already in the ground. Although we've seen some quite incredible precedents now in the US with the um, DAPL pipeline being shut off by a court decision. And so now in the politics around um, the Michigan pipeline, it's I think pipeline companies are extremely nervous about um, the sort of expanding possibilities for infrastructure. And this is a project that's quite old. And so pipeline companies have really not been forced to think about what to do, how to retire pipelines. And so these are questions that are really only starting to become answered in the regulatory process, at least in Canada. And so these are things that um, are really coming, conversations that are coming to the fore now. And these projects are quite vulnerable, and especially because pipeline development has been extremely stalled in Canada, the political stakes are quite high and Enbridge is extremely nervous um, because this is one of the main lines that um, are part of its mainline system. Okay, uh, Kate, did you have anything you want to add or? No, oh yeah. Well, I just, I did want to pipe in that some of Amy's other work uh, does some comparison between projects that are brownfield, so projects that are already built and being expanded or replaced versus ones that are greenfield, new transmission pipelines and the kinds of political arrangements that are then possible. So, so you know, that, that point about the possibilities for opposition for things that are already built versus things that are brand new for new land transformations 
um, do look a little bit different. And, and you know, we see that in other infrastructure as well, things like hydropower dams, uh, where we're thinking about aging infrastructure in a different way than we're talking about new infrastructure development. So that's not necessarily a clear set of, of points to how to advocate against a particular project, as much as things to consider about the differences even between things that look similar, different pipelines. So here's a question, uh, shifting gears to a, a, a bigger question, since a lot of us have political science backgrounds, and I'm not sure how practical this question is, but it's certainly an interesting one. Would it be better to nationalize pipelines so that all Canadians could benefit from the profits? <laughs> so what are people's thoughts on, would it be desirable normatively? And then secondly, you know, how feasible might, you know, what would be the, uh, current hurdles to doing so? Well, I can start by saying that in a way, I mean, the federal government uh, bowed to the Trans Mountain Pipeline. So uh, obviously, uh, I don't think it's part of a big master project to lead in the direction of uh, that is uh, basically uh, alluded by, um, uh, uh, by this question. But I think that the federal government already spent a lot of money to buy a major pipeline project so that it doesn't sink that to, to uh, so that it stays alive. And it did that in part because of the, the political climate in Western Canada, especially in Alberta. Um, the fact that the, the federal government is being criticized for not doing enough to support uh, the, the oil industry and the liberal government, which is very unpopular in Alberta and Saskatchewan, the two largest oil producers in Canada, especially Alberta, of course, uh, um, they, they, they bought this pipeline and there was a great political cost to pay for this because a lot of people on the left thought that it was a betrayal of the environment, environmental commitment of the Liberal Party. So I think that this is very risky politically, uh, especially for a Liberal government and the Liberals are still in power. Uh, they invested a lot of economic, they a lot of money in that pipeline, but a lot of political capital as well. And I think they paid, they paid the price in some provinces, like in Quebec, at the last federal election for doing this, because people, the Bloc Québécois in Quebec and the Green Party and the NDP, they criticized the Liberals. They said, hey, you're buying a pipeline and you want to fight climate change? We signed the, the, the Paris Agreement. So don't forget, the Liberal Party today is a left-leaning left -leaning party. Uh, and it's, it has a, a, a strong environmental platform. So there is, a descript, there is a tension here ideologically and politically for the liberals and the opposition on their left is using that uh, and that's creating some uh, discomfort. And even in some provinces like Quebec, uh, uh, I think it's, it's becoming a political problem for them. Also, oh, just to yeah, add, I might uh, jump in too. And oh, sorry, Andre, go ahead. Okay, Please go ahead, Andre, and then Kate. Yeah. Well, I, I think again, if, if in the Canadian perspective, I think you know, probably the last thing that the governments of Alberta and Saskatchewan want to do is put the pipeline in the hands of the federal government, right? For all kinds of historical and political reasons. So. Uh, let's just say there's much less trust in the federal government than there is in the, in the private sector. So I think that that would be a major hurdle. Kate? Yeah, and I think another question to think through um, when thinking about kind of ownership structures of oil and gas projects, whether at extraction or at transmission, is the question of what is already under production and how do we share the benefits uh, in more, say, just or equitable ways? which is, is, goes back to that question that Andre and, and Daniel were telling us about equalization payments and, and the questions around that. And the second is what do we want to invest in as a country moving forward? So as collectives, as, as a polity in the US and or in Canada, what is the direction for the future? So what do we do with existing infrastructure? Who should own it? Who should benefit from it and how? And the second is, do we want to focus on this question of nationalizing pipelines versus keeping them private, or do we want to think about different energy futures? And I think that's that's where at least uh, Sarah and Amy and my work comes back to is is what are we building these for? You know, what what kinds of conversations do we really want to have about ownership of energy? Great, yeah, thanks, thanks, Kate. So the next question um, is from uh, someone who will be a future presenter at one of these NAC events, uh, Heather Millar from the University of New Brunswick. Uh, and she's asking about shale gas 
uh, and how it's different, uh, how the dynamics you guys talked about with oil sands extraction uh, might be similar or different with shale gas. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? I can start us off and I'll, yeah, I think it's a super great question. I'll also toss it to Kate because her um, book is actually launching tomorrow at the University of Toronto. So I hope she can um, mention that a little bit, but yeah, the politics are similar in some ways and very different in others. They're similar in the sense that um, gas pipelines in Canada and particularly in BC are particularly the recent ones have been um, just as contested as oil pipelines, although that's a fairly recent development. Uh, contestation around pipelines really started with oil sands pipelines, although now we're seeing this kind of politics really expand into gas production as well. And even though the economics of gas production are a bit different, the oil and gas industries are very closely tied. And so a lot of these major companies, uh, TransCanada was a, a a major owner of the Coastal Gas Link Natural Gas Project, which was blockaded by the Wet'suwet'en. And uh, TransCanada has now tried to uh, offload its ownership stake again to the uh, entities of the Alberta government. And so you see this pattern also playing out uh, in, in gas politics as well. Yeah, and I, I mean, I have, I have lots to say about the politics of shale, but I'll, I'll just say one, one kind of quick thing about the role of narrative in this, which is um, one of the differences between oil sands pipelines and all the debates over shale gas is a question that shale was introduced, shale gas was introduced as a lower carbon solution. So the debates over whether that's true have been fierce. Um, you know, that, that's sort of a, a question on its own, but it's certainly been a powerful narrative for government. And so I actually, I'd be curious to hear Andre and, and Danielle's visions of what this means uh, for kind of state politics, for, for governmental level politics, but we certainly see a difference with the BC government opposing oil sands pipelines and, and BC polities doing that, but much more mixed views about whether liquefied natural gas should be produced. So I do think that carbon narrative, that climate change uncertainty and the way it was introduced is a, is a big factor in those. No, just, just quickly, I think, and Danielle maybe can speak to this too, but I, I do think that the framing is different. Uh, I, I do think that uh, um, rightly or wrongly that uh, when it comes to oil pipelines, this is when uh, Canadian parties, at least probably maybe Canadian citizens as well, uh, perceive a greater tension with, uh, you know, fighting climate change objectives. Uh, and, and I think because also at the level of the narrative and the frames, um, you know, uh, it's it, the image of, of uh, uh, you know, adverse environmental consequences has really largely been linked to you know, the so-called Alberta tar sands, if you want to use that, that expression. And, 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 and I think that's gained so much more attention than, uh, than the alternative, which like you said, was initially promoted as being a lower carbon alternative. So uh, I think, you know, focusing and stressing uh, the way things are presented here uh, gives us part of, uh, part of the answer. Yeah, and I would say, I mean, shale gas often is, is it becomes more kind of an internal provincial issue. Uh, we saw that actually in New Brunswick. We have a question from someone in New Brunswick or in, in Quebec. And when we talk about tar sands or oil sands, and people then really, when you use the term oil sand, you're maybe more favorable tar sand in, in Canada. When you use that word tar sand, it means you're really against it normally. Uh, it's interesting how people choose the words, uh, obviously, as, as Kate is smiling. And of course, she knows all about that. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I think it says it doesn't have the same, uh, I would say it doesn't capture the imagination as much at the federal national level. We talk way much, way more about what will happen with, with you know, oil sands and, and, and pipelines than, than shell gas per se overall, at least in, in, in recent, in, in, over the last few years. 
But again, Kate is much in a much better position than I am to talk about this. But uh, in terms of federalism, I don't think it's as prominent, uh, certainly not in, in, in the last few years. All right. Well, if an, unless anyone has any uh, last thoughts, um, uh, I guess we'll have to end it there. It sounds like people should check out Kate's new book. Um, but uh, thank you to all of our uh, panelists. Um, and by the way, these themes that have come up today, um, like you know, Andre was alluding to um, federalism, which tied into our first presentation with Douglas McDonald. There's a number of themes that are sort of going to keep running throughout this entire uh, series. And so we would very much encourage people to, to join us for our next session, which is on March 9th at noon. We will have a former California Public Utility Commissioner Diane Gruenich talk about um, electricity policy and specifically um, how to regulate uh, imported uh, electricity from Mexico. And then we'll also have um, Monica Gattinger uh, of the University of Ottawa talk about North American Reliability Corporation and a number of other issues related to electricity policy. So thank you all. Thank you to our panelists for being part of today's event. And uh, we hope you have a good evening and stay with us. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.